everyone, and welcome to another edition of Eye on Arts, brought to you by West Kentucky Community and Technical College. I'm here today, my name is Paul Aho. I'm the Dean of the Paducah School of Art, which is a division of the Community College, and I'm here today with John Hasegawa, who is a ceramics professor uh, for Paducah School of Art, and we're gonna talk a little bit about some ceramic art that's been on exhibition here recently at the Clemens Fine Arts Center and the Fine Arts Center Gallery um, on campus at West Kentucky. So um, I'm, I'm going to try to introduce this today with John in a fashion to talk a little bit perhaps about the differences between functional works of art and uh, the things that we see largely on display which seem to be more sculptural in character and perhaps we can talk a bit about um, some of the artists specifically and see if we can't uh, open this world up a little bit for our viewers. Yeah, thank you for having me on the show today, Paul. Uh, the first artist we should talk about is Stephen Hill. He's a functional potter, and uh, he's one of the pre preeminent potters probably in our country, and he really focuses on making some beautiful throne vessels. And he does a lot of slip work on the outside as long as using these great glazes, and his forms are just really beautiful. I remember that um, one of the hallmarks of his work was like the single fire glazing and using these uh, slip finishes. Can you tell us a bit more about that technically or aesthetically, how that makes its work what it is? Oh yeah, he um, throws these beautiful, uh, one example that we have on the show, he throws these really beautiful pictures that are really bulbous and they come up to a really narrow neck and have a beautiful spout and a beautiful handle coming down. So he makes a, uh, the vessel on the wheel, he throws it, and then as, uh, when it's still wet, while it's still on the wheel, he takes slip, which is clay that has been watered down and liquefied into kind of a consistency maybe of like, um, like whipped cream. So it's kind of spreadable across the surface. So he spreads it all across the surface. And then he takes a spatula or a rubber tool. And then just like how a cake de decorator can mm -hmm. decorate the yeah. cake using a spatula, he spins the, the pitcher and kind of uh, moves that slip around on the surface, so he creates this beautiful kind of line of slip, kind of that trails around the vessel. And so then, it's a physical surface oh, yeah, in addition to just coloration. Mm -hmm. And I, I never knew that that was done on, before it was bis fired. So oh. these are done on wet clay forms. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so that allows you to, the slip is, you really need to do it while it's wet. If you're gonna put that much on, because uh, the clay shrinks a lot during the during the drying process and the slip will shrink with it. And if you do it while it's dry, the slip will uh, fall off like a peeling paint. And then when he glazes it, he uses a spray gun and he sprays a base color, which is this great uh -huh. crystalline uh, glaze that he mm -hmm. sprays on and then he sprays different colors on top. So he has lots of beautiful greens and blues and uh, some darker browns and blacks that he sprays on the surface. And then on that surface, it can, um, those, these really beautiful crystals form all across the surface. So, it, and some people think it looks like a snowstorm or it just, and little dots form across that surface. It's really mm. nice. Oh, so he uses the slip to articulate the surface oh, and yeah. then this glaze to where the coloration and such. Mm -hmm. And oh, then the yeah. way he sprays his glaze is he uses this directional sprayer. So it is a little bump. And we talked about how mm -hmm. that slip is right. a little bump on the mm -hmm. surface where he sprays. He can just kind of spray in a downward right. motion. So that bump catches a certain mm -hmm. glaze at a high angle. And then that it just, just forms a different color that's really deep and beautiful right there. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Okay, so um, given that he likely is the only artist in the exhibition or whose um, work we're going to talk about today that works in a functional, mm -hmm. sort of almost a production mode. Yes. He's a high production artist and he travels and sells his work in, in uh, events around the country. Let's talk about some of the artists who work in a more sculptural mode. Mm -hmm. Well, some of the artists that are maybe more transitional between sculpture and functional are maybe... Um, Feng Shu, who makes these beautiful <laughs> little teapots, and he's kind of um, referencing uh, Yixing Tea Pottery, which is uh, the, the first uh, pottery town in China to ever make a teapot. That's the origin of a teapot. And so they make these really beautiful, small, little teapots. And so Feng, Feng Shu is taking that idea and kind of using that, and he makes these just gorgeous little vessels, and he uses these really beautiful colors. And he puts a little, a little spout and a little handle and a little lid on there. And they're just, just great and beautiful and colorful objects. Right. 
And didn't you tell me that he used to make these in considerably more miniature fashion? Yeah, he used to make the ones I saw were really small, like you could fit like in the, the like in the palm of your hand. And mm -hmm. now I think he's getting a little bit bigger, and they're just the uh, the form I think just looks almost perfect when you look at the the way the shape. It looks like um like almost like a little perfect uh, piece of fruit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And his colors are just magnificent. Really but they're nice. still not um, functional teapots. They oh, are, yeah. They are strictly objects, like those small sculptures that come from this lineage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you could try to use them, but the lid is, like, really small. Mm -hmm. You know, and so that's the thing that you'd have a hard time getting water or tea into mm -hmm. them. But mm -hmm. they look functional from, from far away. And there's a whole kind of movement uh, in ceramics about the non-functional teapot, as the, the teapot as a sculptural mm -hmm. object. So in the, this case, they function more like decorative objects than mm -hmm. functional objects. Yeah. And, and then we have artists that we're talking about today whose work fully uh, moves beyond that and is strictly sculptural mm -hmm. and functions on a physical level like sculpture does. Yes. Right. So one of the artists is Mark Luthold, who makes these beautiful um, discs that he carves and puts these great textures on. And so I think he throws them on the wheel to make those beautiful uh, blank disc. And then he lays them flat and then he uses a knife to cut these beautiful angles in on them and he removes the clay. So you end up with this piece that's very textured but radiates kind of from the middle. And those pieces in the end, I think it, I, I, I see something that looks coral-like and because it looks, has this kind of symmetry, yet kind of natural look to it at the same time. And then, and then he stands them up and he carves both sides. They're just really gorgeous. Mm -hmm. They have these exquisite organic patterns oh, yeah. like coral or other natural materials, but mm -hmm. they have a life of their own that is res responsive to um, his work crafting that clay. Mm -hmm. right? And it's it's definitely, he really deals with the clay on a, on a as a, as a medium, right, but diff doing it in a different way than I've seen any other, other, other artist's work before. And what's interesting about the one piece in the show as well is the, the fact that it's not a flat disc mm -hmm. and that it's like a convex, concave form mm -hmm. yeah. that you can read three-dimensionally as well as two-dimensionally. So it reads as both sort of painterly surface mm -hmm. and this exquisite um, subtle formed object. Yeah, it's like yeah. twisted, yeah. like it got right. twisted in the mm -hmm. fire. He right. probably twisted it while I, it was drawing. I would expect so, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. so awesome. Mm -hmm. And he's been, I've been a great admirer of his for a really long time. Mm -hmm. Double, uh, one of my friends has one of his pieces, so every time I'm over at her house, I'm just like, whoa, there's mm -hmm. a Mark Luthold <laughs> disc there. Mm -hmm. He's just awesome. And who else would we talk about? Uh, uh, Jennifer McCurdy oh, does yeah, these right, great right. vessels and similar, similar sort of mm -hmm. you know carving sort of stuff, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. and she you know she starts on the wheel and she's definitely kind of referencing the functional, mm -hmm. but she's definitely moved away from making it truly a functional vessel, like where Fang Shu is still referencing a functional vessel that's definitely meant to be used. So he's only moved away just a little bit. Where Jennifer McCurdy starts with these beautiful throne vessels, and then she distorts and carves them to um, the one piece we have in her in, in the show is called the wind bowl so that mm -hmm. she creates these great lines that kind of twist up from the bottom and up and around and kind of end up there so there's a lot of manipulation she does mm -hmm. and her forms are just so beautiful and the lines are so gorgeous that she leaves them unglazed so they're just raw porcelain mm -hmm. Just awesomely beautiful. And when you pick it up or when you're looking at it, she has manipulated so much, it doesn't even feel like a thrown vessel anymore. It looks like it was hand-built. It's just awesome. And then the other one, I can't remember the title, but she has cut away so much. It looks like rope, like, hanging there. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's so exquisite just to pick it up. It's, it's, it's such great craftsmanship there. Yeah, she's really remarkable. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can't imagine trying to build those. She must be, have practiced a lot. And um, let's see, who else might we talk about in terms of um, non-functional work? Oh, um, Annalise. Annalise Heinen. Yeah, Annalise uh -huh. Heinen. So, so Annalise Heinen, she makes these very large vessels and bowls, and they're just really whimsical and have, uh, and they're just beautiful colors and the way how she's manipulating the clay, and they're all hand built and slab built, and she's. We want to include her in the show. I visited her studio and I was just blown away by her work and by her craftsmanship and the color and the scale of the work. And I felt that having someone like that here in the show to be represented, that's how working in that way was, 
was a great way to round out our show here, to bring someone else here. And then she also has a teapot, a really large teapot. And so she's referencing that teapot, but it's definitely sculptural because it's like that big with the handle comes around, this huge spout that kind of reaches yeah, off. It's kind of the opposite of, uh, side of the coin from Fong's work. Yeah, and, there's, right. and so I've never seen anybody, like, like it's very rare to see someone really working in that scale with those colors and that kind of whimsical flavor that she's doing. It's, it's just awesome. Well, I, I think it's important to, for our viewers to see the sort of range that's mm -hmm. um, possible as well in, um, in terms of making things out of clay and the sort of challenges you look at um, Mrs. McCurdy's sculpture and just mm -hmm. uh, and all of how that would be crafted and the same is true with Annalie's work in terms of how to build a form of that size and you know the, the sort of painterly work that's involved. So it sort of bridges uh, sculptural and painterly as a technology as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we have a guy like um, John Utgard, Utgard yeah, from, from, from Murray State, mm -hmm. whose work, you know, in some measure, yeah, well, we know it's ceramic work, it sort of begins to resemble glass work at a mm -hmm. certain point, the quality of those glazes and the subtlety of that and the sort of way light um, is absorbed by the form and such. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it just his, his forms are also beautiful, the way he's just sculpting. And in a lot of ways, those two pieces they have in the show kind of seem almost like opposites of each other. And in some one way, they're kind of very similar. They have a similar texture, but they're kind of, kind of very spiritual and quiet in the way how they work toward the way how we see them. You know, one seems like it's like it's almost like you froze like a drop of water, like right when it hits the water, it kind of has that... Mm -hmm. The, I forget what they call it, like the recoil of the water as it springs back up after the drop hits, mm -hmm. there's a little spike that comes back. Mm -hmm. That's just a beautiful piece. Yeah, I mean, it's very basin-like. Yeah. It has this sort of um, almost altar, ritualistic aspect mm -hmm. to it uh, as, some, as a, a basin form. And the other one is this sort of inward aspect to it, yeah. right? and both in terms of its light absorbency as a, a, this remarkably dark object, but also with that, that sort of geometric space that's been carved out of its interior and mm -hmm. the, the spectacular glaze that's applied on both surfaces. Yeah, and that, that larger dark object just reminds me of, um, it's like a Japanese stone altar. They mm -hmm. have things like that. And especially in the countryside of Japan, they mm -hmm. have these stones that they will find a stone that they look really interesting. They'll drag it away from them wherever they found it on the side of the mountain. They'll put it in the center of their yard you know, by the mm -hmm. where the tarp swim, they'll put this just giant stone in there. And oftentimes they'll, they'll put a geometric hole in it like that to kind of reference and just kind of add visual interest. And I feel like John's really kind of exploring that area with that piece. It's just awesome. Yeah, they, I don't want to speak for John, and of course I shouldn't, but they seem to have, mm -hmm. um, both pieces seem to have this sort of spiritual underpinning, yeah. right? I know you can see... Um, forgive me, but you could see burning incense or something in that form, and you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. or the way that they do in Indonesia, where they put out offerings for the spirits and for their ancestors and such. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just really nice work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really beautiful, and, they, and the glazes that he employs. So it's not just um, the sculptural forms that he makes, and there's sort of uh, idiosyncratic and spiritual aspects, but it's the, the the experience that he brings to that glazing process that make them so remarkably beautiful as objects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure we bring artists that that, are, um, that kind of represent many different areas of ceramics into the show. So we, I think he was a really good choice to bring that kind of spirituality into our into our show here. And then we have got um, a guy like Vince Patelka, oh, yeah. who makes these beautiful functional forms or functional in appearance, but just by the scope of their scale, mm -hmm. um, they 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 burst out of that realm and they become objects that occupy space, like sculpture occupies mm -hmm. space. And he has this large jar that he put in the show. This awesome, looks like it has an ash glaze on there. It's just a gorgeous surface. And this, like you said, the scale is just awesome. Once you get above a couple feet in ceramics, it really becomes the craftsmanship and the difficulty of making sure that piece gets through all the stages of the firing process intact is just becomes a feat in itself. And, just the massiveness of the jar and the way how it has this like great lid kind of just bolted down and has these metal handles on there as well. It's just awesome yeah, in I, scale I, and appearance yeah. and gives it so much strength. I think that's interesting that he's employed metal into the ceramic work. And mm -hmm. um, I certainly like to see our students begin to do the same thing as, <laughs> as we open our metals and jewelry studios yeah. along with the expanded ceramics program. 
in January to begin to see your students or our students begin to incorporate um, materials from outside of their specific discipline mm -hmm. to sort of enhance the language of their practice and add an element of the unexpected to the work. Right? Mm -hmm. I can see that happening, especially with like the, what, how Vince is using as an accent, how the mm -hmm. metal can work really well mm -hmm. with that. And I can see us trying all sorts of, I mean, I think the possibilities are endless. Right? Mm -hmm. And whose work were we looking at that we thought, uh, oh, that was the that was another program that we were looking at something that we were thinking is it that it was ceramic but it was actually metal in character. Todd Todd Burns. No. Uh, oh, is it Todd Burns? The one someone's in the show. Well, anyway, let's talk. <laughs> let's talk about Todd Burns' work for a minute, right? <laughs> Since we're on to that, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, Todd Burns is in our show, and he mm -hmm. uh, I just really love his uh, forms that he's making because he's really. So we have other teapots in the show, and, mm -hmm. and those other teapots are one, we have Annalise, who's really sculptural. We have Fong, who's kind of referencing the traditional style teapot, and Todd Burns is really referencing the mechanical, the man-made vessel, like an oil can or like some sort of like watering, metal watering jug that mm -hmm. we use for watering mm -hmm. plants. And so he's then he's bringing that back into the primitive form of clay, and he's using a very nice... Uh, glaze that he sandblasts to kind of give it that kind of pot mark, non-reflective surface, like the way the, a metal um, pouring vessel would look. And he gives um, uses uh, his base is actually made out of metal that I think he sandblasted that and put a similar surface treatment that really kind of makes all these three pieces kind of tied together: his lid, his um, his vessel, and his uh, tray all kind of match and kind of makes a nice little vertical. Uh, Assemblage, it's just really nice. Mm -hmm. So th those pieces, that piece in particular is slab built, is that correct? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, yeah. I uh, looked at it, but it's always hard to tell because mm -hmm. one, a lot of artists like to kind of trick people into thinking one thing versus another mm -hmm. way they construct them, mm -hmm. you know. So in clay, you can always make it look like you made it a certain way. And so a lot of artists love to work with slabs, but like the, but their pieces end up looking thrown or vice versa. You know, it's you can you can also coil build it as well. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of different ways to approach oh, the forming yeah. process mm -hmm. in ceramics. And you know, just for our listeners, traditionally, what differentiates forms is this: either throwing, where we use a wheel, and mm -hmm. you know, forming practices that are um, consistent with that. And then there are um, any number of different ways to sort of conjoin clay to itself mm -hmm. to create forms. Mm -hmm. right? So like the, yeah, so the uh, way we run it is we teach pinch potting, which is really basic. You don't need any tools. Then you can coil build, which is you're stacking uh, little snakes of clay on top of each other and smoothing them together to make a form. And then slab building is where you take a flat sheet of clay and then you can then with that flat sheet, you can bend it and manipulate to make a form. And then, of course, there's a wheel. And you can use any of those processes to kind of achieve your goals, depending on I mainly try to teach students to work in the in the area that they feel most comfortable and because you can get a lot of mileage out of each process. Mm -hmm. And we will have new studios that will allow them to explore oh, yeah. all these possibilities yeah. and uh, a variety of new firing techniques and processes that we mm -hmm. haven't had in the past. Mm -hmm. So you know, the range of things that we see between um, your work and between Vince Patelka's work and between uh, Mr. Utgard's work and all of these different um, applications of um, surface effects and coloration and the, the, the sort of secondary aspect of the, the art of working in ceramics, not just the form making, but those surface effects and the beauty of glazes and mm -hmm. the way glazes either reflect light or absorb light and the ability to play with that as physical stuff. And mm -hmm. when you know, I teach a painting class, and certainly I talk to my students about the fact that paint has a physical skin as well as the, a function as a colorant, mm -hmm. right? And, yes. and to be, a, you know, cons attentive to that mm -hmm. in terms of constructing an object rather than just an image. Right? Mm -hmm. And so our, we'll have a glazed lab that's actually a separate room at our facility where um, the students will be able to experiment with all sorts of different glazes. So in ceramics too, we spend a, a lot of time experimenting with glazes. I teach them all how to uh, make their own glazes. So if they see something or interesting surface, that they can try to replicate that on their own because that really completes their journey as a ceramic artist or maybe not really complete, but kind of shows them the, the full range of the process so that they start by forming clay. They have to actually imagine the end, like what surface do they want to put on it at the end so they can kind of chaperone their piece through every step of the way into our kilns, making the glazes, and then back into the kilns and to the final product. I think 
the, we just can't overemphasize the importance of glazing in mm -hmm. ceramics. So then there's a lot of pre-visualization and then visualization oh, yeah. processes required of the artist in mm -hmm. terms of before beginning the work and you know how the work is constructed and like where this work is ultimately going. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. um, so all these artists that are, that are in the show, right, they have a clear kind of, um, they have a clear vision of what they want their pieces to be and uh, you really need that because the surface, different surface treatments that are like what Vince uses probably wouldn't, wouldn't be appropriate on anybody mm -hmm. else's work and the really colorful, Anna, what Annalise puts on her pieces wouldn't really work on somebody else's. So mm -hmm. as you go around the room, as you see the show, you can see each artist has chosen their area that they want to really specialize in and then that, that how the form works, how the surface works. And when they begin a piece, they usually have a pretty good idea of how they want it to develop. Now, some pieces, like I think uh, John Utgard doesn't necessarily know exactly what he wants in the end, but I'm sure the clay speaks to him as he's working. And by the time he's gotten close and he has a pretty good idea of what he wants to have happen with his piece. Okay, John, well, there's another artist we haven't spoken about yet that I think really makes beautiful work. And though I think the piece that we're going to talk about today is perhaps a little atypical of his, um, the types of things that he builds, I, th I think it's instructive because the glazing technique involves something that uh, we're also bringing to West Kentucky through an expanded array of kilns mm -hmm. at our new ceramics building mm -hmm. at Madison Hall. And that would be Bruce Dennard, mm -hmm. if I remember his name correctly. Mm -hmm. And um, he has this small sort of sculptural object yeah. that most people w would kind of wonder what that's about. It looks like a sort of a natural form, like a found stone mm -hmm. or a rock or something. But it, it too has this sort of Japanese, almost Zen-like aspect to it mm -hmm. um, that we would find perhaps um, in some measure in Mr. Utgard's work. But what I, what I specifically would like to have you talk a bit more about is this wood firing process mm -hmm. and how different that is from other technologies for uh, creating surfaces on ceramic forms. Yeah, the, the Bruce Standards piece was a wood fire piece. It's called ingot, and so he, um, it's a piece that has layer. Looks like it has layers of clay, and then, um, then he put in a wood kiln. A wood kiln is, it's uh, we call it a new. You said it was new, but it's actually probably the most primitive way of firing uh, ceramics. So probably it's probably discovered by the Egyptians because they're the first ones that had the technology really to build a kiln that could withstand really high temperatures. And they would put all their uh, pottery in this kiln, a giant tube basically that's made out of clay, and they would put all their pottery in there and in the front there would be a firebox. And they would basically continuously feed wood into the front of this kiln. And then the, the whole kiln then would slowly heat up. So, you know, wood burns at 451 degrees, mm -hmm. but it's not about how hot it burns. It's actually about the amount of energy that you're actually putting into the kiln. So each piece of wood equals a piece of energy. And then as that energy slowly builds, that heat will slowly build in the kiln. And you can get this kiln, these kilns up to 23, 2400 degrees Fahrenheit. And at that temperature, all the ash from that was flying around in the kiln from the wood, because there's a draft kind of pulling this ash back up the kiln. So whoever builds the kiln engineers that mm -hmm. draft into it, right? Yes, because mm -hmm. it has to like, pull, because mm -hmm. it's like a giant, kind of like a giant machine. Like you know, if your car can't push out its exhaust, it won't mm -hmm. run anymore. So the kiln's usually built on a hill, so the firebox is down below. The heat mm -hmm. will rise through the kiln and then out a, out a chimney in the back and that will heat up everything as you run it. And so these kilns can run for like five days, seven days straight for 24 hours a day. So you're constantly throwing this energy in. And as the ash lands on the pots, the kiln gets hot enough actually to turn the ash into a glaze. Just like we can, so that glaze will melt on the surface and um, then actually glaze your pottery. It's pretty, or your sculpture in this case, as Bruce pieces. Mm -hmm. And so this is something you or our students would learn about in like um, your classes through glaze chemistry and mm -hmm. such practices. And to my mind, that seems rather unique for a community college environment. Yeah, I don't, I don't even know that. I don't even know another community college that has one. There's a lot of four-year colleges will have them, but not even that. I mean, there's a lot of schools that don't even have the because it takes some resources and space to have a wood kiln. And it's, and. It's just, I think, a great practice, and it's a great opportunity for our students to be able to learn this process because it really, it's another level of control where they, one level of control is learning how to mix their glazes, another level of control is learning how to control the fire, letting the mm -hmm. fire glaze their pieces. So it, 
that will be involved in the loading because the way how you put the pot in the kiln changes the effect, the glaze effect, because the firebox is down here and the flame comes this way and hits your piece, the ash will land on the little bit on the leeward side mm -hmm. and some, and they get really blasted from the front. So it changes the way how you look at your piece. It'll be glazed more by the ash on one side, it'll be glazed less. So if you're involved in the loading, which will teach them how to load, they'll help see a whole nother step of the process. And so really usually when you load a kiln, it doesn't make any difference as much where you put your piece, how you put your piece mm -hmm. in there because the uh, kilns are usually really uniform in the way how they fire. But in a wood kiln, we actually want it to be ununiform. We want it to be directional. Mm -hmm. It kind of creates a movement. You kind of let the, the kiln kind of finish painting your piece. It's mm -hmm. a great opportunity for our students. That's very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And what seems interesting as well is that it's such a sort of communal process or yes. community process in yeah. any event. Are you firing this thing for five days? You can. Yeah. It depends mm -hmm. on what you want to do. So the mm -hmm. kiln that we're building is more what we call a teaching kiln. Mm -hmm. And this kiln, we can fire it in one day. We can start it the morning and be done by dinner time. Or we can let the fire go longer. So we can let it go for three or four days. So if it becomes a super popular idea where we have lots of support from the community and the students, and we can load it and we can let it run for many days. And it changes the effects of the pottery because we'll have more time. If the longer the firing, we'll have more ash build up. And then so that directional effect will become stronger and look more primitive because it's a really a primitive way of firing. Pretty, It's pretty unique. It's just, I just really love it. And do different types of wood generate different sort of effects? Oh yeah, because mm -hmm. um, uh, the more the, basically has to do with the ash. So usually harder woods like oak will produce a lot of ash and lots of good directional effects. A friend of mine uses lots of alder, which is kind of a hard wood, and that does a different kind of effect, and he gets a lot of grays. And the one wood that really burns really clean with no ash is cedar, right? So um, or a pine, and that those have hardly any ash at all, but they provide lots of heat. So a lot of kilns will do a mixture of both, where oak burns really slowly, provides a lot of heat, but it releases the heat very slowly because it's a very dense wood. And the pine will release heat very fast, but won't give you too much ash. In the end, you really want the ash, in my opinion. And then, so pine is the same way, heat, but not so much ash. You know, they certainly are very beautiful objects, mm -hmm. and we certainly are grateful for your role in bringing these things mm -hmm. to uh, West Kentucky and certainly to West Kentucky Community Technical College. Um, for our viewers, I, everybody should know that um, we do an annual program of six exhibitions that include um, the Ceramics National, where the works that we're talking about come from. Uh, we're doing, we did a Jewelry and Metals National Invitational, and we're doing a Photography um, Invitational uh, that will open in the mid or early March. So we invite our viewers to the exhibitions that we program. Uh, we're grateful to the college for their support and to the Clemens Fine Arts Center for the other things that they do in the community in terms of the musical programs and the theater programs and the other great things that happen here in the community as a result of what takes place here on the campus um, of WKCTC. So I want to thank our viewers for being here with us today. I thank John Hasegawa for um, his good work for the school and his role in putting together um, an excellent display and the topics for us to discuss here today and invite you all to um, come and visit us at your leisure. <laughs>